right, this is what we're gonna be making. If you're new to this channel, then hey guys, my name is Robert Shane. And on this channel, I give you solutions to your tech problems, how-to videos, and tutorials. I don't wanna waste any more of your time, so let's get into it. Before we begin, I'm using the current stable build a Blender, AKA version 2.93. If you've never used Blender before, I have a playlist, link in the description, on how to download it, and I cover some of the basics. Blender is free, so why not give it a try? I suggest watching some of those first and then come back and watch the rest of this video. So to begin, let's delete the default light. Let's rename the default cube by selecting it and pressing F2. Let's go ahead and disable it in both the viewport and render. Then let's add literally any other mesh, it doesn't matter. Then tab into edit mode and press delete and then choose vertices to delete all the vertices. Then tab out of edit mode. Now we have a mesh object with no mesh. Let's rename it to GeoNode. Did you say nerd? Not nerd, node. Oh. Now with it still selected, we'll add a few modifiers. So come down to the modifiers tab. Let's add them first and then go through them one by one. Let's add a geometry nodes modifier and rename it to grid. Then add a displace modifier. Its name doesn't matter, but be sure to enable this button or you'll be pulling your hair out later. And finally, let's add another geometry nodes modifier and rename it to scale. Now, before we start working on them, let's create two textures that we'll use to drive stuff inside of these. One will drive the displacement. So let's create one by going to the texture properties tab, then clicking new and let's rename it to Displace Texture and change its type to Clouds. The other one will drive the scale. Click the New Texture button right here to make another texture, then rename it to Scale Texture and switch it back to Displace Texture since we're on the Displace modifier. We'll change the settings to both of these textures later so we can view the changes in real time, but in order to view them in real time, we first have to finish setting up our modifiers. So let's go back to the modifiers tab and then change our layout by clicking the geometry nodes tab up at the very top. Make sure you have the first geometry nodes modifier selected. Whatever you have selected here is what gets populated in the geometry nodes area over here. First, let's delete the group input since we won't be needing that. Then add a grid by pressing shift A and searching for grid. The settings I used for the final render was 100 on all the fields. So let's set them all to 100. Then let's connect it to the group output and we're done with this setup. Back on the modifiers tab, I'll skip over displays for now. So click on the last geometry nodes. First, add an attribute sample texture node. From this drop down menu, select the scale texture we created earlier. The mapping is going to be UV map and the result will be scale. Next, add a point instance node and insert it after the attribute sample texture. The object will be the instance cube. As you can see, we're getting some results, but it's not looking good yet. To fix it, let's adjust our textures. Back in the texture property tab, you can use the very top dropdown menu to switch between modifiers that use textures. Make sure this is set to displace and that the texture is set to displace texture. Then set the type to clouds, crank up the size to 10. Then under colors, disable clamping. This will prevent flat areas. As far as height goes, it's looking a little weak. I'm gonna set mine to eight. Now let's adjust the scale texture by going back to the texture properties tab and switching the top dropdown menu to scale. For the type, I use distorted noise, amount to 1.7, size to 0.37, Keep clamping on. On this one, you do want so-called flat areas, quote unquote. Flat areas in this context means that when the scale goes below zero, it won't go past zero, which has like an absolute value effect and would make our cubes bigger. Set the brightness to 0 0.744 and set the contrast to 0 0.234. I'm just giving you the settings I used in my original scene. You can of course play with these however you feel like. If you're playing around with these yourself, I recommend adjusting the contrast first. The lower it is, the more similar neighboring instances will be. Then adjust the brightness until you have something nice. The opening shot was just a simple dolly with the camera rotated at an angle. If you want to see how I animated the turnaround, I've gone over it before in this video, just skip to 601. Now let's change our layout to layout so we can see stuff better. To get the displays modifier to animate, let's create an empty plane axis and call it displace controller. 
Next, we can attach it to the displace modifier by going back to the displace modifier on the GeoNode object and changing the coordinates to object and using the displace controller as our reference object. Now when we move the displace controller, it moves the texture as well, which moves our displacement. Ooh, pretty. To animate it, I'll use an expression. To do that, just type in hashtag sign open parentheses frame times 0 0.03 close parentheses for the X location. That'll make it wobble back and forth on the X axis. Then let's do hashtag cosine open parentheses frame times 0 0.03 for the Y location. That'll make it move in a circle. Before we move on, there's a few things to know about this expression that I'll think you'll find useful. If you want it to move faster, use a larger number in place of 0 0.03. A value of one will make it go around the circle every two pi frames. All right, let me set that back. If you want it to move further, multiply the whole expression by a number. It'll repeat after the same number of frames, but the texture will physically slide around more during that time. Speaking of repeating, you may notice it's not repeating. If you want to calculate the number of frames you need to make a perfect loop, the equation is 2 pi over n, where n is the number we multiplied frame by. So in my example, n is 0 0.03. Therefore, my animation would repeat every 209 frames because 2 pi over 0 0.03 is 209 after it's rounded to the nearest whole number. So let's set our timeline to n at 209, and you'll see it loops perfectly. And finally, if you want the animation to start in another spot along its cycle, just add a number to frame. To demo this, let's stop the animation and set it back to one and make note of where the displace controller currently is. Make sure to put parentheses around frame so it does the order of operations correctly and use the same offset if you want to keep it in a circle, which might be something you're going for. Who knows, I'm not gonna judge. Now when we play it, it still loops, but it starts. It starts here instead of over here. The final expressions will look something like this, so pause your screen if you need them. 50 is the offset, 0 0.03 is the speed, and 10 is how much it moves. How much it moves is a little related to the speed, but it's different. The speed will affect the length of the animation loop, while how much it moves won't. I've gone ahead and reset the expressions. Before we start shading, let's turn on viewport shading so we can see what we're working with. Shading is a little unintuitive. You have to apply the shading on the instance cube and not the geo node. So let's select the instance cube and under its material properties, we'll set the base color to 0 0.588. One for the saturation, one for the value, then come down and change the emission color to cyan. I'm using 0 0.626, one and one. And finally, increase the emission strength to something high, like 63.2. Now go to the render properties. For rendering, we'll be using the EV renderer. First, enable bloom and set the radius to 7.185. Then set the color to a bright cyan. I used a hue of 0 0.413 and a saturation and value of one. The bloom color doesn't have to match the base color of the instance cube. In fact, it can look quite nice when they're different colors. Set the intensity to 0.006. I think these settings are a good starting point. You can play around with them to taste. Under depth of field, I cranked up the max size to 200 pixels. Now with the camera selected and your cursor over the 3D viewport, press zero on the numpad to view through the camera, then press N to see the end panel. On the view tab, enable camera to view then hide the end panel by pressing N again. Now we can move the camera while using a mouse like we normally would. I explained camera movement in depth in a previous video, so check that out if you're new to camera movements in 3D. You may notice some of our cubes are disappearing if they're really far away. To fix that, let's click the green camera icon tab and next to N, set it to 1000. Position the camera so it's in a nice spot. I recommend getting a composition that has some elements that are really close to the camera. Then let's enable depth of field. In its settings, set the f-stop to a low value. I used 0.1. And finally, adjust the focus distance until you're satisfied. If there's too much blur, you can increase the f-stop. 
I'm gonna keep mine at 0 0.1 though. In the world properties, change the color to black. At this point, if we render it by pressing F12, it should look something like this. I'm running a GTX 960, and for me, these render in about one to two seconds. If you make something cool, please send it to me. My social media links are in the description. I might showcase them in a future video. Well guys, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something useful. Have a good one and take care.